Well, good afternoon. What a joy to be here with you. And I drove up with, with my daughter, my six-year-old daughter here with me. It took us 15 minutes this morning to park and to get here. Now that's a good thing, why? Because of the enthusiasm and the turnout. So good for you, I love the classes that you're putting on and just this enthusiasm, because apologetics is as important today, if not more than it's ever been in the history of the church. I live in San Juan Capistrano, even though I teach at Biola, and not too long ago, I was in the line at a mall in Orange County, waiting for the new version of the iPhone. Came out on a Friday, I got in line Saturday, some around 11 in the morning and didn't leave for four hours later. The line went out of the Apple store and down about four or five stores. And I'm standing there and these three students come and walk, walking up right to the guy next to me. They said, hey, we're talking about Jesus. What do you think? The guy doesn't say a single word. He turns around, leans on the railing and completely ignores these students. So a little bit embarrassed, they start to walk away. I said, hey, what are you guys doing? They said, oh, we're talking about Jesus. What do you think? I said, you know, I'm not even sure he existed. Do you really believe that Christian stuff? <laughs> the guy says, well, of course we do. Don't you know Jesus, son of God, and he died on the cross for your sins and he starts preaching the gospel. And I simply looked at him and said, why should I believe that story? He holds up his Bible, he says, because it's right here in the Bible, which is the word of God, which is true. Of course, I said, how do you know that book is true? He said, well, if you turn to this passage in 2 Timothy, it tells us that all scripture is inspired. Is that a good argument? If you want to know if the Bible's true, you can't turn to a passage within the Bible, assume it's true to prove itself. I said, is there any evidence outside the Bible that tells us it's reliable? He said, yes, don't you know? There's these tens of thousands of ancient documents that completely match up and tell us we have the Bible exactly as it was written down. I said, really, do you know how many words are in the original Greek New Testament? At this point, I know exactly what he was thinking. Why did I have to talk to this guy? <laughs> he says, no, I said, there's about 136,000 words. Then I said, if you take the original language it was written in and you compare all the different manuscripts, do you know there's between 300,000 and 400,000 differences across all these different manuscripts? I said, that means for every word in the Bible, there could be two or three other words. Can you explain that to me? He goes, um, ah, uh, what do you think about evolution? I said, I'm glad you asked. The evidence is overwhelming. Don't you know we have vestigial structures in our backs left over from our ancestors with tails? Don't you know humans and chimps share 99.5% DNA? Haven't you seen an embryological development? I'm just going on and on. And this guy's like backing up and his eyes are getting bigger. Finally, I stopped and said, you know, I got a confession to make. I'm a Christian. <laughs> and he goes like this. I wish I had it on tape. He goes, oh. But then a girl next to him looked really bothered by this. She said, was all that true? I said, look, I'm a Christian. And part of being a Christian is I believe the Bible is true like you do. I said, I'm a Christian. I don't buy this Darwinian story for all of reality. I believe in intelligent design. I said, but you know what the difference between me and you is? Is that I actually know why I believe it. Don't you think if you're gonna go out and tell people they should commit their lives to a book and to a person and an idea, you should have some good reasons why it's actually true? They agreed and I congratulated them. I said, good for you guys on a Saturday out sharing your faith at the mall, but go learn a little bit why you know what you believe. Well, they left. 10 minutes later, I'm facing this direction. Feel a tap on the shoulder. I turn around. It's three new students who say, we're talking about Jesus. What do you think? Well, I'm just tired of sitting in line. So I start to launch into my charade again and until I look carefully over their shoulders about 150 feet in the back, I see the original students who set up their friends to convert the atheists. <laughs> now the question is what's gonna happen to these students when they leave the comfort of their home, they leave their Christian school maybe or their Christian church and they have a professor who says this not once, but day after day after day, their faith is gonna get rocked. Of students who say they believe in Jesus, after the university years, 
between 40 and 59% have disengaged the church and many of those have left their faith. Do we see why apologetics is so important? One reason is to help our young people realize this isn't myths, this isn't stories, this is really true. How do we know it's true? The sad thing to me is these kids could go out and share their faith, have no awareness that there has been a revolution in Christian thought over the past five decades, where we have some of the most powerful and compelling evidences pointing towards God and their parents and their pastors, their youth pastors, their teachers never even taught it to them. To me, that's a tragedy. One reason apologetics is important is just to strengthen believers and give us the conviction this is true. But there's a second reason why I think it's so important. I think apologetics can actually help with evangelism sometimes. I had a friend who called me out of the blue, pick up the phone and he goes, hey, Sean, you teach your students in apologetics how to defend the faith, right? I said, yes. He says, well, where do you start? I about fell over, why? Because this is a fellow who got perfect SAT scores in high school and math, went to a great university. And for probably 10 years, I had been talking to him about God, the Bible, Jesus, and no interest, like water on the back of a duck, right? Just, you know, no interest. Now he's calling me, asking me how we know Christianity is true. I said, I'm happy to help, but why are you calling me? And you know what he said? At that time, his brother, who was 15, got a brain tumor. He said, it's shaken me up to realize my own mortality. I don't know all the reasons why God might allow evil, but C.S. Lewis was right. God whispers in our pleasure, but he shouts in our pain. So this student asked this friend of mine if we could meet. He was heading up in a coffee shop as he was heading back to school. So we went to a coffee shop. I met him. Doesn't even any like quick words of hi. He goes, all right, I don't have a lot of time. I need to know, is there any evidence that God exists? We sat down for an hour and a half. I pulled out a Starbucks uh, napkin, pulled out a pen and wrote some of the very things down that we're gonna talk about for the next few minutes. Taking the time to really understand this will build up your faith but certain people have genuine intellectual barriers and want to know, is there evidence that God really exists? Now, we're, there's a whole bunch of different arguments we could look at. We're just going to kind of hone down on, you know, maybe three in the time that we have. And in particular, on some arguments that relate to the issue of scientific development, because we live in a culture so shaped by what science says it has a certain authority in people's minds. So we're gonna look at three and what we're gonna see is that in the past few years, the more we've learned about the universe, the more it points towards there being an intelligent mind in the universe. Now this should not surprise us because after all, Psalms 19, one and two, 3000 years ago, David said, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hand. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they display knowledge. Now, what we're gonna do is I wrote a book called Is God Just a Human Invention? And we walked through some basic arguments for the existence of God from physics, biology, cosmology, something from morality and the soul. Now, we're gonna look at the top three. We won't look at the moral argument, but this is a very compelling argument. It basically says, if there is a real standard of morality, then there must be a real moral law giver. And everybody knows there's a real moral law. If somebody says there's no such thing as right and wrong, cut in front of them in line. <laughs> what are they going to say? That's not fair. I got here first as if there's this real standard of morality we're both bound to. That's a powerful argument that Romans 2 hints at. We know because we're made in the image of God. The soul, I think, is another argument. And we're going to focus specifically on three scientific ones that I personally find very, very compelling. So let's begin in the world of physics. Now, I grew up in a little town called Julian, up in the mountains. Who's been at Julian? Okay, good. Actually, I, it was in, on the third grade bus when I was growing up. My friend, Jesse Nichols, whose mom started Mom's Pie, if you've ever been up there, he says, hey, that girl on the bus, her name's Stephanie, looks cute. Go sit by her and ask her if she thinks I'm cute. Well, because Jesse said, I went by and asked that girl, Stephanie, if she thought my friend Jesse was cute. Bottom line is I married her, he didn't. (laughs) 
Might explain why my favorite song is the 80s song, Jesse's Girl. <laughs> well, I grew up in Julian and I would imagine you come visit me in Julian where I used to live and you go walking through kind of the hills and the mountains of Julian or maybe more close like in Big Bear. And you come across this abandoned cabin and you think, well, that's strange. I'm gonna go explore. But as you walk up to this cabin, you notice something really strange. You hear the sound of your favorite song in the background. Beat It by Michael Jackson. <laughs> but then you walk up more closely and you hear the scent, you, you smell the scent of your most beloved meal. You open up the door and you look down and it's boots your size, a jacket that fits you perfectly. You look on the table there and there's all the books you like to read. You look over at the TV and you see the DVD series or video games you like to play. Or when you walk over to the refrigerator, you open up and you see all the snacks you like to munch on. You walk, there's a bathroom and you open up, it's all the toiletries you normally use. Now, what would you suspect? Besides thinking that someone was stalking you, <laughs> you would know for sure that this could not be coincidence or chance, that this place was arranged ahead of time with you in mind, right? They would know in a sense that you were coming. You know, scientists have learned about the universe as a whole in just the past few decades, that there's certain conditions in the universe that make it just like this cabin. So Freeman Dyson, a well-known and respected scientist, not a Christian. He said, as we look out into the universe and identify the many accidents of physics and astronomy that have worked to our benefit, it almost seems as if the universe, in some sense, must have known that we were coming. <laughs> now, this is actually an argument that many... Uh, philosophers will call either the teleological argument for design and specifically the fine-tuning argument for the existence of God. Now, what do we mean by fine-tuning? You get in the shower in the morning, what do you do? You take the hot and you take the cold and you fine-tune it so it's just right. Right, it's like Goldilocks and the bowls of porridge, right? That's too hot, that's too cold, just right? There's certain laws in our universe and certain constants that have, all have one strange thing in common. They're set precisely where they would need to be to have a universe capable of supporting life. So some philosophers I've heard describe it as like life exists on a razor's edge and the slightest change to the left or the right and the entire universe would become inhospitable to life. That's why Frederick Coyle, who coined the term Big Bang, he said, as we look at these, these, these constants in nature, it almost seems as if someone's been monkeying with physics. And I think he's right. So Paul Davies, another well-known uh, scientist from Arizona State University, not a Christian, more of an agnostic, I would say, said the cliche that life is balanced on a knife edge is a staggering understatement in this case. No knife in the universe could have an edge that fine. So what do we, let's clarify exactly what we mean by this fine tuning idea. I teach at Biola now, and I also went there as an undergrad. And when I went, went as an undergrad, my, uh, my senior year, there's a dorm, if you've ever been on campus, kind of the back side of campus by La Mirada Avenue, and it's called Thompson, and it's a graduate dorm. And the cool thing about this dorm is they have kind of two or three stories. And one of my friends was living there, and he got the wonderful, wonderful idea that we would take his window, because at his window, as we looked out, it was on, I think, the second or the third story. And in front of it was a large parking lot, at that time, a tall row of trees, a big gutter where water would go through, and then a stop sign. So he got the great idea that we would take one of those huge, massive, life-size, like, water balloon launchers, and then welcome our fellow students home at night with a water balloon to the windshield. I mean, this is a great idea, right? Now, you know what I'm talking about, these huge, like, water balloon launchers? 
a lot of them take like three people to use. So one, they look like a big rubber band. One person holds it on this side. The other person holds it on this side. Then you pull the middle back with a pouch. You put a water balloon, an egg, a cat or something in it. And you let it fly. <laughs> so we got the idea. We thought, wow, we're going to go right to his window and launch these water balloons over the parking lot, over the trees, cross this and hit cars. Well, we tried just time after time. In fact, he had a whole bucket of water balloons sitting by the window as cars would come home. And we just missed day after day. We're chilling there one night and we see this smaller red car come from the back and we thought this is perfect. It was like slow motion. So we grabbed the water balloon launcher. One of us grabbed this side of the window. One of us grabbed this side, put it on the window. He, we pull back with a water balloon and let it fly. It goes up into the air. It goes over the parking lot. It clears the row of trees crosses the water, the, the gutter, the car stops at the stop sign and bam, smacks it right on the windshield and cracks it. She has a heart attack. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that bad. That's actually really messed up that you laughed at that. That is, no, I'm just kidding. Needless to say, our water balloon launching days came to an immediate end. Right, But just think about this for a second. How many things did we have to get just right to hit our target? What if there was more water in the balloon? What would happen? It wouldn't go, it, it, it wouldn't go far enough. What if there was less water? It would go further. What if we went the angle this way? What if we went the angle up? What if we pulled back more? What if there was wind? Can you see all these parameters that had to be set just right? for us to hit our target. Well, in a sense, this is kind of what's true for the universe. To even have a universe capable of supporting life, there's all these factors and different constants that must be just right. And the tiniest change in any one of them and the entire system becomes inhospitable to life. So Mark Horton put it this way. He said, if the balance between gravity and the expansion rate were altered by one part in one million, billion, 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 there would be no galaxies, stars, planets, or life. You know what he means? Since the, be since the time that the universe uh, began, the universe has been expanding in every direction. There's a force that causes it to expand. If that force was stronger, the universe would collapse in on itself. If the force was weaker, it would expand so quickly and we couldn't have galaxies, stars, planets, or life. Do you see the point? This force had to be just right, like the force of launching the water balloon had to be just right. Do you know how fine-tuned that when it says one part in a million, billion, 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 billion? You know how fine-tuned that is? That's equivalent to all the mass of the universe compared to one grain of sand. In other words, if it varied mathematically speaking, one grain of sand more or one grain of sand less, the universe would be inhospitable to life. Now that's pretty incredible to just think about, isn't it? Well, guess what? This is only one example. Scientists have found at least 30 physical or cosmological parameters that must each be finely tuned for life. Now, I've seen some studies, people say it's well over 100, and that's probably the case. I put 30 up here just to give us a conservative estimate of which I find little debate about. So some of you people who love math, or maybe I should say one of you who loves math, <laughs> I say that in jest, my wife was a high school math teacher for a number of years, and she just doesn't find that funny. I'm glad you do. You might be thinking, wait a minute, if the odds of one is one in a you know, million, billion, 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 what happens if we start to add all these together? How fine-tuned does the universe have to be? Well, what happens if we take two? So these are some of the different constants in physics that have to be fine-tuned for there to be life. So the expansion rate of the universe, the force of gravity, etc. What happens if we take two of these? the force of gravity and the cosmological constant. So the force of gravity must be fine-tuned one times 10 with 40 zeros after it. The force of gravity one times 10 with 53 zeros after it. Mathematically speaking, what are the odds that we would have both of these set right where they need to be for life? It's equivalent of one in a hundred million, trillion, 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 trillion. 
Now that's a really big number. If you have a hard time grasping that number, just think of our new national debt. <laughs> that was kind of a painful laugh, wasn't it? A uh, nervous laugh. This is actually the equivalent of one atom out of all the atoms in the entire universe. So if you mixed up all the atoms and you took some really small tweezers, really small tweezers, and you reached down and grabbed one, the odds that these two would be fine-tuned to have a universe capable of supporting life are the odds that you would find that one atom. This is why Roger Penrose from Oxford University said, if we combined all the laws that must be fine-tuned, we couldn't even write down that number in full since it would require more zeros than the number of elementary particles in the universe. And I think he's right. You see, the argument is if the universe is fine-tuned, the question is what best explains that fine-tuning? Well, it can't be chance because the number is simply too vast. It can't be some natural law because a natural law can create order and repetition, but it can't create something that's exquisitely fine-tuned. Now, the other response people say, well, this is part of a multiverse. Our universe is fine-tuned. We have all these different universes that exist, so we shouldn't be surprised that we find ourselves in a universe that is actually fine-tuned. And the evidence for a multiverse is zero. There's none. In fact, William Lane Craig, who teaches at Biola and is just a great philosopher, he said the fact that people have to posit this idea of a multiverse is a backhanded compliment to the power of design from the constants in physics. And I think he's right. The fine tuning of the universe points towards a fine tuner, an intelligent mind. Well, let's look at a second one here. So that's the world of physics. So we're dealing with these vast, large levels. Now let's move down into biology, into the micro. So we're gonna move from the macro down to the micro and we'll see that Psalms 19, one and two is still correct. That the natural world, the more we probe it and understand it, and the further we can look into it, the deeper sense of complexity and design and intricacy in fact we find. Now, one thing about biology we actually know, which may surprise you, is biology is not just the study of living systems. You see, biology, according to Nobel laureate Dave Baltimore, is a science of information. You see, since the discovery of DNA in 1953, scientists began to learn, learn that the most basic kind of component to life is not matter, it's information. So the processes we're able to do in the body and the, the functions that are performed are the result of information stored not only in DNA, but also in other parts of the cell. Information. Well, you actually look at the human body and in a sense, your body is like a large memory stick that stores information. Every cell on your body stores this information. So here's the question how much information is in the human body. When I first heard this, I had a hard time actually believing it was true. I'm not sure if it is, but it sounds good. No, I'm just kidding. You know, the average human body has 100 trillion cells. 100 trillion cells. Inside each cell is DNA. If you took the DNA out of one cell and you uncoiled it in length, it would be an estimated nine feet in length. So you know what this means? If you took all the DNA in your body and you uncoiled it and strung it together, it would go from here to the sun and back about 70 times. That's crazy, right? This is where you say, wow, just to make sure you're getting it. Okay, good. 70 times. Now, what does DNA actually do? Again, DNA stores information. So for example, this was a very conservative estimate, it actually comes from Richard Dawkins. He said, a single cell in the human body has the equivalent of 8 billion letters, 500 million words, or 8,000 books. 
The Discovery Institute recently released a report and they said that they would estimate that the average cell in the human body can store the equivalent of 500,000 DVDs of information. Some of you young people here are like, man, I would love to have that much information on a memory stick. Yeah, if you did, many of you would still get bored. <laughs> so this raises a really interesting question about the source of this information. But when we start to understand this on the micro level, we realize that something Bill Gates said was true. He said, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software we've ever created. And yes, that's also true for Apple. <laughs> so the question is, given the complexity of DNA, where does it come from? What's the source of all this information on the micro level in the cell? Well, those who are unwilling to consider a designer remind me, one option they offer reminds me of one of my favorite comedies. Take a look. <laughs> oh God. I love that clip. Every time it gets me, right? The humor is obvious. When she says one out of a million, what does she mean? Yeah, she's kind of trying to nicely say you don't have a chance. He's like, one out of a million, I got a chance. You know, one, not the only one, but a common explanation for the origin of information is chance. In fact, in his book, The God Delusion, which is arguably the most popular new atheist book read by millions, I asked some of my atheist friends, I said, I'm taking some students through an atheist book. What's the best one? They said, take them through the God delusion. I took my students through it, high school students, 12 of them. And his explanation for the origin of life, he actually uses the word luck. Boy, we got lucky, it was chance. And then Darwinian evolution took over. In fact, he actually came up with a very interesting hypothesis because it raises the question, how much can chance produce? And he came up with this hypothesis called the monkeys typing Shakespeare theorem. So Dawkins wrote in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, he said, if we have enough monkeys and we have enough time, eventually one of them could sit down if they had a computer and a typewriter, and eventually one of them would type out all the works of Shakespeare. Now, do you understand the thinking that he's coming up with? He's trying to explain how we get all the information we see in living systems through an unguided, blind, purposeless process. So he comes up with a monkey's typing Shakespeare theorem. And the question is, is this possible? Can you get monkeys to sit down and type out the works of Shakespeare? Well, interestingly enough, this study was actually done. And you know what they found? There's an MIT quantum computational physicist. He estimated mathematically, given the size of the universe and all the time and the resources available. You know his conclusion? Not all the works of Shakespeare, not one work of Shakespeare, not one chapter, not one page, not one paragraph. Four lines from one work of Shakespeare, as you see on the screen, is all that chance could produce, given all of the resources the universe has to operate. I don't have enough faith to believe that that could result in even far greater complexity inside the cell. But actually some scientists got together and some students and decided to test the monkeys typing Shakespeare theorem. So they actually put some monkeys in the painting zoo with some computers and typewriters to see if they'd sit down and start typing out Romeo and Juliet or Hamlet or something. Well, the first monkey picks up a rock and tries to bash the computer. <laughs> Another monkey climbs up on top and goes to the bathroom on the computer. But before you mock this experiment, in the few weeks they were in there, these monkeys actually produced seven pages of written text. Surprising, huh? These monkeys in there produced seven pages of written text. A string of A's, L's, M's, and an occasional J and a few S's. Not a single word. Now, in case you haven't visited the Biola bookstore in the back and loaded up with wonderful resources, you can actually go online and purchase the literary works of these monkeys. They've been put into a volume called Notes Towards the Complete Works of Shakespeare. <laughs> now you're chuckling because you think this is crazy, right? It's just simply not gonna happen. There's not enough resources. There's not enough time. 
Because see, you know something that I do. If you come down and visit me in San Juan Capistrano, I actually say to you high school students that are out there, if you're thinking about going to college, you wanna to go to Biola, you need a place to come do laundry, do a warm cooked meal, you let me know and I'll pray for you. <laughs> That's my commitment to you. You come down and visit me in San Juan Capistrano. Say we go to Capo Beach and we go walking along the sand and we come across something that says John loves Mary. Now, none of you would stop and say, man, that's why I live, I live inland at the desert. I don't live at the beach because when earthquakes hit here, messages arise from the sand. <laughs> none of you would say, gosh, the tides out here on the coast are crazy that they leave messages after they leave. That wouldn't even cross your mind. You see, you would know that there's no natural explanation that can account for the writing and the information that is here. Now you might read that and go, oh, John does love Mary. You might read it and think, well, maybe Mary wants to be loved by John. <laughs> but you'd know for sure that somebody wrote that, right? See, in his, I think, magisterial book, Signature in the Cell, Oxford-trained philosopher of science, Stephen Meyer said, whenever we find information and we know the causal story of how that information arose, we always find that it arose from an intelligent source, right? So if you have a book and you trace it back to its source, you find an author. If you take a newspaper and trace it back to its source, you find a journalist. If you don't know what a newspaper is, ask somebody over 30. <laughs> if you get a text and it's legible, you trace it back to a texture. You look on your shirt and it says, Hurley, there's information, you trace it back to a designer. If we walk outside and in the clouds it says, drink Coke, none of you'd say, oh yeah, Sean, that happens out here in the desert when a storm's coming from the east. <laughs> you would know a pilot or a mind wrote that because there's information. Well, when we look inside the human cell, we don't see the equivalent of drink Coke or the equivalent of four lines of Shakespeare, right? Or John loves Mary we see more information that is more sophisticated and complex than anything humans can come close to creating today. I don't have enough faith that this resulted from some law or chemicals in motion. It seems to me like the fine tuning points towards a fine tuner. The information in the cell points towards an author of life. Interestingly enough, I'm not the only one who says this. A number of years ago, when I was in grad school at Talbot about a decade ago, we would read of a famous atheist by the name of Antony Flew. You see, Antony Flew for five decades, starting in the 50s, actually with a paper he presented at Oxford at the Socratic Club before C.S. Lewis. He had the most widely read philosophical treatise on God, it was called Theology and Falsification. What he would argue is that the idea of God is meaningless and God cannot exist. Deeply and profoundly influential atheist for half a century. Well, he died a number of years ago, but shortly before he died, he released a book. You know what it was called? There is a God. Why the world's most notorious atheist changed his mind. You know what changed his mind? It was scientific evidence that did not exist when he first began his examination. So Anthony Flew says, what I think the DNA material has done is show that intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinarily diverse elements together. The enormous complexity by which the results were achieved looks to me like the work of intelligence. And I think he's right. Friends, in physics, we've learned, we've seen this unbelievable fine tuning, which points towards a fine tuner. We peer down into the depths of the cell and we see this massive information, which points towards an information giver or an author of life. I was sharing both of these with my friend on a napkin. We were making progress. He said, all right, I need at least one more. I said, fine. And for this last one, I'm actually gonna give you two premises and a conclusion, a very simple and yet I think profound argument for the existence of God. If you take the time to just write it down, I'm glad to see some of you are taking notes. I don't take notes, I have photographic memory. I just don't have any film. <laughs> Sorry, I used that in my breakout session, but that's okay. It was a good one, right? So here's the other argument. We're gonna look in the world of cosmology. Now, cosmology studies the nature and the origin of the universe. 
The nature and the origin of the universe is what we learn about in cosmology. Now, let me give you a little background here that I think might be interesting. Up until the 20th century, it was essentially unanimously agreed by cosmologists that the universe is eternal. It didn't have a beginning. It's always been here. So if it didn't have a beginning, it didn't need a beginner. But there were some scientific breakthroughs in the early 20th century, including a scientist by the name of Einstein that started to call this into question. You see, when Einstein was developing his theory of relativity, he noticed that the universe itself was not static like it was assumed, but was either expanding or contracting. Now, he didn't like the implications of a non-static universe. If the universe is moving, if you go back in time, it might imply that there's some kind of beginner. So instead of following where his mathematics led him, what Einstein did is he introduced something now famously called the fudge factor. He changed his mathematical equations to avoid a beginning to the universe. But then a few years later, with something called the Hooker telescope, which was the, the, the original Hubble telescope, is that scientists look out and they notice something very strange about the universe is they looked out and they noticed something called the red shift. You know what that means, the red shift? Is that they could tell scientifically because of the light that the universe was expanding in every direction. The color of what they saw on some of these being reflected by these galaxies out there told them that the universe was expanding. Now, can, how can color tell them the universe is expanding? Well, look, you actually use something similar in your own life. So you can tell by sound if, say, a motorcycle is coming towards you or going away, right? If you're a high-pitched sound that goes, neat, you know the motorcycle is what? It's moving towards you. If you hear a low pitch that goes, new, what does that mean? It's moving away, right? That's because of the sound waves. So as you're running into the waves, what happens? You get a higher pitch or higher frequency. Like if you're walking out into the ocean, you hit the waves more regularly. If you're in the ocean walking in, you hit the waves less regularly. So the sound waves can tell us whether something is moving towards us or whether it's moving away. Well, the same is true with light. As they looked out for the first time outside of our galaxy and can see all these galaxies in the universe, they noticed that what was happening is the universe was expanding in every direction. In other words, space itself, in a sense, was stretching. What did this mean? If the universe is expanding and you hit rewind, what happens? It goes back to a moment of a beginning, which is why Frederick Hoyle coined the term Big Bang. He said, it seems like we go back to the beginning and there was just this Big Bang. Well, Einstein traveled and looked out through this telescope and saw the universe expanding. You know what he said? He said, I repent. You know what repent means? It just means to change your mind. He said, the universe must have had a beginning. I was mistaken. And this has become scientific confirmation of one of the most compelling arguments in a sense for the existence of God. So let me show you the premises. It's called the cosmological argument. You don't have to remember the name of it, but I sat there with my friend and I said, let me draw these two premises and a conclusion. You tell me what you think. And here's what it looks like. Step number one, whatever begins to exist has a cause, right? Think about it. Does this make sense? If something begins to exist, it has a cause. Things don't begin to exist without some cause to bring them into existence. So I'd say to my students for years, high school students, I'd say, can you think of something that began to exist uncaused? And one time a girl said, well, what about love? She said, maybe love just comes from nothing. And I said, does love really come uncaused? I think of the sound of music. There's that song where Von Trapp and I don't know her name. My wife loves the movie. And they're singing a song together. And they're like, where did our love come from? Did it come from nothing? Nothing can come from nothing. Nothing ever could. Even love, we might not understand the cause, but there's still a cause from which it comes. Right? We don't see things in the universe just coming into existence from nothing. When things begin to exist, we always find there's some cause for it, right? I mean, this is kind of a common sense principle. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. And what we found with some of this scientific evidence now brings us to premise number two. 
the universe began to exist. We actually know through philosophical arguments, we also know through theological arguments and through science that the universe has not been here forever. The universe actually began to exist. And there's very little debate about this. In fact, I was watching the show Universes and Alan Guth, the leading cosmologist was on there. And he said, if somebody doesn't believe in the Big Bang, that person is a scientific crank, right? I actually believe in the Big Bang. I just know who banged it. So stop and just reflect upon this for, for a second. If it's true that whatever begins to exist has a cause, which certainly seems to be kind of obviously true as you reflect upon it, if the universe began to exist, which all the scientific evidence consistently points towards, then what's our conclusion? The universe what? The universe had a cause. That's it. Therefore, the universe had to have a cause. Now think about it for a second. If the universe came into existence, then what did this cause have to be like? Well, the cause couldn't be physical because physical matter came into existence. The cause wouldn't be in time because time itself began. The cause would have to be very powerful. It'd have to be very intelligent. And I would argue it has to be personal. Now this is just an argument, not even using the Bible, but what does it tell us? a powerful explanation for the origin of the universe brings us to certain attributes that the Judeo-Christian tradition has held about God for centuries, for centuries. In fact, it was findings like this that made people read the beginning of Genesis arguably a little bit differently because of all ancient texts that I've seen, I don't know any other ancient text that says the universe began to exist it all assumes the universe is eternal. And that the Bible uniquely says, in the beginning. That's why a classic book written in the 70s, after they started to discover some of the stuff in the fine tuning, called God and the Astronomers, this NASA scientist famously said, he said, it's as if in the 20th century, we have all this scientific breakthroughs and people start to understand certain things about the world they didn't understand before. He said, as these scientists, it's like they're climbing this mountain of knowledge and they've been working for centuries. They finally get to the top of understanding scientific knowledge about the origin of the universe. They peer over and they see a band of theologians who've been sitting there for centuries. <laughs> Friends, this is a compelling argument. In fact, I shared it with my friend. He said, well, what about Jesus? I walked him through the evidence for Jesus. What about the problem of evil? I gave him some of the responses that you heard from Clay Jones. He looked at me and said, all right, I think I believe that Jesus is God. Sent at Starbucks. I said, all right, you believe he's God. Are you willing to follow him? He said, I think I need some time to think about this. I said, okay. Fast forward about five years. He was still thinking about it. I said, man, you told me to my face that you thought Jesus was God. How come you're not willing to follow him? He said, well, two reasons. Number one, I don't like Fox News. I said, you're gonna have to expand on that one a little bit for me. <laughs> he was under the impression that if you became a Christian, you had to hold certain political views in a certain way, and he found that odious. Second, he said, I'm not sure what my friends will think. And instantly I knew that it had nothing to do with the evidence. It had nothing to do with the truth. It was an issue of the heart. Friends, you know what the role of apologetics is? Number one, it's to build up Christians, to give us confidence. I take students on trips all around the country. We went to Salt Lake City. It was great to spread out my students in groups of two to knock on doors and say, hey, we're missionaries. Do you have time to talk about Jesus? <laughs> and I train my students. They came home from this trip and they start calling missionaries doing it themselves. I'm taking students in a few weeks to Berkeley and we bring atheists and agnostics in and we let them speak to our students and our students walk away going, man, this is really true. So, Christian, so apologetics is to give Christians confidence that it's true. Second, it's to clear away objections so people can see the person of Jesus clearly. And then it's up to the spirit of God working on their hearts if they're gonna respond and follow Jesus. If we love people and we present the truth, we have been faithful regardless of how they respond. Amen. Amen. 
I won't go into details. There's some amazing resources in the back, William Lane Craig stuff. They're carrying my book, Is God Just a Human Invention? If you wanna go and explore these a little bit further and even so many other arguments for the existence of God, we haven't had a time to go into. You guys are in for a treat. I'm just the warm up because you get a chance to hear from one of my friends and one of my heroes in the faith, Lee Strobel. That's coming up soon. Thanks for letting me share. Blessings.